Back live with you tonight. Kosato has expressed its support for the public service workers' struggle for decent wages and a reasonable standard of living. The trade union is disappointed that the facilitation process seeking an amicable solution to the ongoing wage dispute has not yielded positive results. To take this conversation further, we now speak to Matthew Parks, his parliamentary coordinator for Kosato. Matthew, good evening and thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, good evening. Thank you for having us. So, Labour and the employer agreed to engage on a facilitation process in order to take the negotiations forward this, this past weekend. What transpired? Yeah. So, look, I, mean, I don't think we'd want to, to give any commentary on negotiations. Um, we have, in any negotiations, we have a bit of confidentiality and so forth. Um, and, you know, I think what you can say, the macro issue is that it hasn't, we haven't reached an agreement yet, um, but I think we do want to give space for our unions who negotiate at the Collective Bank Council to, 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 to do the negotiations. I think we want also for government to come to the negotiating table to engage in good faith. Um, but it's a very messy situation uh, because our unions are aggrieved on many fronts. Our public servants are quite aggrieved that for the past you know, few years they feel their rights to collective bargaining have been, have been undermined. Um, the right to earn a wage has been neglected by the state as an employer. Um, you know, have different issues trying to manage those contradictions as well. Uh, but I think the bottom line is the government is negotiating in good faith, not only on this year's agreement, but I think also to find ways to address public service grievances about the previous years, especially 2020 when there was no wage increase. Uh, so that's, that's the bottom line. We hope government will find a way to address workers' concerns in a way which affirms their right to earn a living wage. Um, the correct, to respect collective bargaining. Of course, we are sensitive as unions that we don't want a situation where government goes off a fiscal precipice and hence there is a need to negotiate. Um, also, last if government doesn't engage and find ways to address public servants' grievances, it then will erupt like you're seeing now over the past you know, week or so uh, with, with protests. Often protests become quite messy. Uh, because public servants really agree that the employer has not respected um, their needs, their rights, uh, their, their responsibilities as parents. I think the sacrifice they have often made, um, and in fact, what they feel is that the government as an employer is really outsourcing the bill for corruption, for wasteful expenditure upon public servants. So the need to negotiate and to find a way to address their legitimate concerns. Yeah. So I mean, fr from uh, my understanding is that there are two areas here. One is the 2022-2023 wage dispute. That matter is in dispute. And then there's the 2023-2024 wage offer, uh, which again, the, 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 the union is, is rejecting. On the dispute of 2022-2023, has the employer tabled anything for the consideration of the unions further than, of course, the fact that they're going ahead with the implementation of the 3%. Yeah, so I think that's part of the, the grievance for some of the unions is that uh, while some of the unions felt that there was still a CCMA arbitration process going forward uh, for, the, for the last financial year, the employer just went ahead and implemented it. And that um, it divided unions. Some unions have one position, some unions have a different position. So that made it quite messy. I think the bottom line is that many unions I feel aggrieved by last year's wage negotiations, how they, they ended abruptly. Um, this year's engagements obviously are still ongoing. Uh, but of course, again, it's dividing unions. It's making it quite complicated because some unions are at the negotiating table. Other unions well, look, for us to enter the negotiating table, you need to go and resolve last year's issue. And of course, you know, under like, all of these tensions and the, the really fraught nature of collective bargaining at the PSCBC is the fact that in 2020, uh, the previous finance minister, basically showed a middle foot to public service by simply tearing up an existing signed wage agreement that everybody had compromised to and negotiated agreed to in good faith. And he simply went to Parliament and said, well, we're imposing a wage freeze for that year. And he actually, in fact, he wanted to impose a wage freeze for three years. So it really has poisoned the waters. This world is making all the negotiations very messy for everybody. And, of course, it's really is demotivated public service is seeing a significant increase in the brain pain of skilled professionals from the state, like doctors and nurses and teachers and so forth. I mean, it's, it's, it's exactly what you've seen in the past few past few days, the past week. I mean, quite messy protest strikes um, across many public service institutions. 
uh, across the country. Yeah. You, of course, tomorrow are going to Parliament to respond to the division of uh, revenue and the second adjustment appropriation uh, bills. Part of the things that we, we heard from the Minister, as you put it, was if a wage agreement is reached in 2022-2023 tax uh, 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 financial year that exceeds the budget, it would pose a risk in the in-year and medium-term fiscal projection. So, in other words, uh, we, we, we would have to make some, 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 some serious um, uh, compromises uh, in, in particular areas of, of service. Yeah. So, look, that would be a, a bit of an example of linguistic gymnastics or more creative mathematics. Um, as you said, tomorrow we're making a submission on the second adjustments to the preparation bill. So, that's for the last financial year, um, one which is, which is ending which included, you know, additional allocations to different departments, um, settling of SCA's debt and so forth. So if you can do it for that, then you, yes, you can do it for, to afford nurses and teachers and police officers um, an increase as well. You can, it can be done. Again, it's not messy. Ideally, we're having a situation where year after year, the budget has been implemented, it's been tabled at Parliament, it's been adopted, etc. you know, around April and so forth. And then uh, by August, September, you're still negotiating and settling on some sort of public wage agreement. You're often you're backdating in six months. So that really is a bit messy. It's not ideal. Uh, part of it is that workers no longer trust the state and employer uh, because particularly I feel around 2020, um, there was a, an, an abandonment of a signed wage agreement. And we've stressed to government time and time again, that has had a huge impact on the labor relations between state as an employer between public servants. It needs to be fixed. Uh, it's not an easy thing. Government <clears throat> govern needs to basically go and take responsibility for what it did, apologize, find some sort of way of rebuilding a healthier labor relations regime between the employer as a state and between the workers. If government wants to achieve the objectives it's set out in the state nation address and be free, um, the objectives are set out in the budget speech a few weeks later, it needs to fix its relationship with nurses and doctors, with police officers, with teachers, with prison wardens, etc. Because the people who are going to implement their commitments, um, the wage bill has not been out of control, as government often incorrectly says. It's been stable at 35% of the budget since 2008. What has happened was put us into a crisis as a, as a country. Is that billions of rands lost to corruption, wasteful expenditure? Is it low shipping, which is crippling the economy? The, the rampant cable thefts? It's devastating transfer to Metro Rail, the cost of many SOEs and municipalities. Those are the fundamental causes of the fiscal crisis, not the fact that we underpay our nurses or teachers. Um, and to be honest, you know, to be fair to the public servants, they are drowning in debt, um, paid glorious salaries. If you look at a police officer making 180000 rand a year, yet we expect him to go and to tackle well-paid, well-resourced criminals. Uh, we have doctors working 48-hour shifts. We have one nurse. Uh, often working huge amounts of hours, covering two or three vacancies. So it really is a burst in the scenes of the public service. And what we've said in the Division of Revenue Bills, that if government continues to impose cuts upon frontline service delivery departments, it makes it much more difficult to reduce the queues of home affairs, to ensure the police vehicles are operational, etc. And we've seen the consequence of reducing the headcount of the public service, where the police count has decreased from 208,000 a decade ago, to about 172,000 last year. Yet crime levels have risen, population growth is taking place. So government needs to do the fundamentals of the fiscal crisis and not to outsource the bill, mismanagement for corruption, stagnant economy, yeah. upon security guards or criminal nurses. So uh, while we are on that question of headcount, government in its uh, budget review document suggests something here. It says that actually when we look at our public sector employment, percentage-wise, compared to countries like Norway and, and Denmark, as compared to the broader employment, our numbers are quite low. So the question is not the question of headcount. They agree that we need more uh, people, especially on the front line. But then it means that the, the, the challenge that we're having is a very high wage bill. In fact, they say the public sector wage bill is higher than that of its peer countries uh, and one of the highest among emerging markets. Five percentage points greater than the OECD average as per a share of GDP. Yeah. So, so again, listen to the fundamentals. The world has been stable 35% of the budget for 15 years. So it's not changed. 
We're not in this fiscal crisis in 2008. So what changed since that time? What changed since that, since that time is that a decade of state capture and corruption was unleashed upon the country, that we, we saw the declamation of South African revenue service where revenues began to, uh, to plummet for the state. We've seen rampant levels of low shedding, which has crippled the economy, plunged us into a recession time and again. We've seen municipalities collapse because of corruption and mismanagement across many rural areas, causing companies to close. We've seen trust that being destroyed by criminal syndicates, stealing uh, cables, you know, copper cables, etc. So those are the fundamental issues. Now, government's basically looking for a short to try to balance the, uh, the budget. That's not correct, because they're not dealing with the fundamental issues. You can impose wage freeze for 10 years upon public service. You're not addressing the fundamental cause of the fiscal economic crisis facing the country. Some said you have to do those issues, and if you impose a wage freeze upon public service, what happens is that you spark a brain drain. We're already seeing a significant rise in the number of doctors going to, to Britain, of nurses going to Dubai, of teachers going to the private sector where they get paid far better, far less stressful conditions. We have a huge outflow of police officers who are extremely stressed. We have detectives having a docket book of about 60 cases. There's no way they can, can address those issues. So we have to deal with the fundamental obstacles to grow economy and fixing the state and not simply choosing to, to take a, a short administrative lazy route, which is simply to put a wage freeze. Um, if you look at what happened with South African Review Service in the past two or three years, competent management has been appointed. They've invested in the IT capacities. They've appointed additional 500 staff. As a consequence, you see the rebuilding of the South African Revenue Service. The result of that is that we had 94 billion rand revenue over collection above the target for this budget year. That's the, the value of investing in the state. That additional revenue meant we could ex, you know, extend uh, the SOD grant, we could extend the presidential employment stimulus, we could begin to pay down the ESCOM debt burden, etc. So if you invest in the quality of public services from home affairs, reduced queues, to police, to arresting criminals, to the NPA, to targeting criminal syndicates, um, protecting our railway infrastructure, which can unlock the mining and manufacturing agricultural sectors, that's how we could grow the economy. But pocketing a single mother who is a nurse, has got two children who's already up to her eyeballs in debt, that's not going to fix the state that's going to break the state. Matthew Parks, appreciate your time. Thanks so much, as always, uh, for coming on tonight. Parliamentary Coordinator for Society there, uh, Matthew Parks, uh, responding to, uh, of course, the facilitation process and what are some of the challenges uh, at that public service coordination and bargaining council.